the principle we have here of momentum as defined as mass times the velocity of some object is going to allow us to describe what happens when objects are interacting with each other. We've already also said before that if you have some sort of external force on a body that you can change the momentum. So we brought up this idea of impulse defined as change in momentum. This is due to then a force acting on a body and the duration that that force is acting on the body. Now, for example, if we were looking at a couple of objects coming at each other, let's have one ball at rest and the other one coming in with some velocity v. And we want to describe the momentum of not just either body separately, but the momentum of the two bodies together. Well, we know once the two bodies hit, there's going to be a force between them. So while each one will have an impulse on the other, will there be a net impulse on this system? Let's take a look. We're going to have these two balls smash into each other, and so there's going to be a pair of forces. So let's call this ball one and ball two. So we know that there's going to be a force of ball one on two, and there'll be a force of ball two on one. We know from Newton's third law that these two forces should be equal but in opposite directions. So that's just a straightforward application of Newton's third law. Now, what will be the duration of the force between the two? Well, we don't know necessarily how long that is, but we should realize that, oh, well, the amount of time that object one is in contact with object two is exactly the same amount of time as object two is in contact with object one. I mean, it seemed impossible that one could touch two, but two not touch one. So those durations should be the same. All right, then. So in that case, we could look at the impulse on ball two, and that would be basically because of the force of one on two times time. And let's just call these two times just t because they're the same. And the impulse on one is simply going to be then the force of two on one times that duration of time. So if we wanted to look at the total impulse, all the impulses together, well, we can see then from our expression that the two impulses here, same time involved, the two forces of the same magnitude but the opposite direction. So we really know that actually impulse two is equal to and opposite to impulse one. So if we were just adding the two impulses together, we would get zero. And this is going to be the case no matter how these objects collide. We made no assumptions there. All we did was the application of Newton's third law. Using Newton's third law, you can derive the fact that momentum is conserved in all collisions, that is, There'll be no change in momentum since the impulse adds up to zero. Conversely, you could actually run this proof in reverse and start from uh, conservation of momentum and derive Newton's third law. You could start which one you think is the more primary, though for physicists, we actually tend to use conservation of momentum. It's actually proof from an even more fundamental aspect of physics, but we'll save that for some later conversation. So if we return to our scenario here, we know that the momentum of this system of two objects will be the same before and after, no matter what type of collision it is. The only thing that would change that is if there's some sort of external force to this system. The collision itself, though, conserves momentum. So the question is then, all right, if we have some object coming with velocity v and it hits two, well, what is it going to be like after the collision? Well, there are two major categories of collision results we can consider. One is that the two objects hit, 
And not only is momentum conserved, but energy is also conserved. The other case we'll have for simplicity is the two objects hit and they stick together. That is, they'll be having the same velocity in magnitude and direction. Let's consider this latter one first. So we can imagine we have the two objects coming in. And then in the next moment, one and two are stuck together and they have some new velocity. Let's call that V prime to distinguish it. So what's the relationship then between velocity and the new velocity? We can use momentum conservation that says that the momentum of the system before and after is the same. So we have the momentum of object one plus the object of momentum two initially. That's equal then the momentum of these two objects after. Now in this case the second ball was not moving so it had no momentum at all. That's just zero and we can we haven't of course said anything about the masses so we'll just leave that as a variable so we see that m1 v using the symbols here has to then equal both objects have the same velocity, so we just a little strip property, m1 plus m2 v prime. So we can see that in this case that the velocity after the collision of our two balls is simply going to be m1 divided by m1 plus m2 v. Now, as you can see from this ratio, this is less than one. It has to be no matter what mass we choose because the denominator has to be larger than the numerator. So in that case, after the hit, the velocity of the balls will be smaller than the velocity of the initial ball that was moving. That, of course, makes some sense to us. That's kind of what we'd expect. If you were driving your car and you hit something else and it gets stuck to your bumper, you'd expect for at least that moment you've slowed down a little bit. And the bigger the object you hit, then the more you get slowed down. If we consider the next case where the two objects hit, and they are conserving energy as well, then of course it means we basically have two conditions, that the momentum is conserved, and again, when number two is at rest. And energy will be conserved. So one half m1 v squared, using the symbols you have here, equals one half m1 v1 squared plus one half m v two squared. So we'd have to have both of these conditions being held true, which of course means that we could combine these two equations so that way we don't have to do just a ton of algebra. We might have an expression that saves us a lot of work. When we try doing the algebra for this particular setup, assuming that object two is at rest before the collision, we can find that the velocity of object one is going to be the difference in the masses times the original velocity divided by the sum of the masses. And velocity two, the object, the one that was originally at rest in this case, <clears throat> is going to then be two times mass one, the one that was moving, times original velocity, divided by the sum of the masses. Now, the momentum of object two looks rather similar to what we had had in the case of the inelastic collision. There was also a multiple of two there. Object one, on the other hand, we see that there's something a bit interesting. 
depending on the difference in masses will be the difference between if um, the object will be moving forward or backward after the collision. If the mass of the object that was originally traveling along is more massive than the object it runs into, then it'll keep moving in the direction it was going. On the other hand, if uh, mass 2 is more massive than mass 1, then it will go backward because this will be negative. Which kind of makes sense. If a um, locomotive runs into a car and they bounce the locomotive might be going at a different speed than it was before, but it'll still keep going forward, and vice versa if a car is running into a locomotive, you'd expect it to bounce back. Or imagining in the case of bowling balls versus pinballs, when you're trying to actually go bowling, if a ping pong ball bounces right back through a bowling ball, takes out the pins just fine. We also see the special case if the two masses are the same. If that's the case, that means that, again, for this perfectly elastic collision and one ball is originally at rest, the ball that was originally coming in is going to stop if the two masses are the same. And if the two masses are the same, well, then this um, term down here, m1 plus m2, is the same as 2 times m1. And ball 2 will just move on with the same velocity ball 1 originally did. If you've ever played billiards or anything with pool with um, billiard balls, you've probably seen this sort of thing. With a good solid hit, one ball hits another, one of the balls stops, and the other one keeps going. Now, we had considered the very special case that object 2 was at rest initially, but we can actually do something even more generally if we're doing everything just in one dimension. Here is a fascinating result I'm not going to prove, but might make some sense after you see it in action, that the difference in velocity before the collision of these two objects is equal to the difference in velocity after the collision. The only difference, though, is the direction. In a sense, it kind of makes, uh, uh, it meets our expectation that the relative velocity between the two will be the same. Momentum conservation, of course, will make sure that this works out, but also energy conservation means we definitely can't have any ultimate velocity changes that matter. And of course, you'd expect after a collision that, you know, for example, you're going to change what your velocity was if um, the case of the billiard ball set up, for example, if they were both the same mass, one ball stopped and the other one went forward with the same velocity, so that meant the, velo the relative velocity between the two was the same. If something bounces back, the other one is then going forward, but still, one way or another, the relative velocity is maintained. And this is true for all elastic, perfectly elastic collisions in one dimension. This is not true for inelastic collisions. This is still assuming we have energy conservation. Now, let's consider one other case, though. What if we have some object that's moving along, and then all of a sudden, it explodes into two pieces? There was some massive explosion at some point. So we can imagine that these two objects might have their own velocities afterward. How would we deal with that? Would momentum still be conserved in such a case? Actually, yes. The explosion is still basically an internal force to this system, the system of, one, of objects one and two, for example. In reality, if you think about it, isn't an explosion pretty much an inelastic collision in reverse? If we were looking at this not from time going from left to right here and they're separating, if instead time went the opposite direction and these objects uh, and everything's going from right to left here, we'd have two objects then coming at each other and then sticking together to become one object. That's if we ran time backward. Well, that case, well, momentum really should just be this 
uh, time reversal thing. If it's conserved, it's true at one time and another time. So in reality, an explosion is just an internal force. We saw that internal forces make it so there's no net impulse on the system. So it's the case that we'll still have momentum conservation here. So m prime velocity hat originally will be then the same as our two masses going separately. And in this case, we're assuming that m prime is just the sum of our two masses. And so we can get a similar result overall as we had done with the perfectly inelastic collision. Now, when it comes to explosions like this, this has an interesting result. If you were shooting off a firework, it's going up into the sky, and then you have it explode at some height. Well, you're going to expect debris in all directions, but if you were to look at the sum of all the little bits of mass and track them together as one big particle, you would still find that it would track the original path without the explosion because momentum was conserved and we still have this whole system running um, due to gravity, it still looks like one object in free fall as normal. So this means if you're uh, shooting off rockets, such as you're for the city and it's uh, 4th of July, you're exploding rockets like that, you still know basically what direction the debris is going to go. It's still going to basically fall along the original path it was fired. That is some good predictive power because if you didn't know which way the debris was going, there's no possible way that you could make uh, firework explosions safe for anyone.